David Leon Lyons is going to give us a talk on geometry and algebra in the hot vibration. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, organizers, for the invitation to speak. This is one of my favorite things, what Bob Pelé was saying. He loves these quaternions. I love the hot vibrations that have quaternions in it. So I'm going to tell a little bit about the hot vibration, but not really much. This is not a talk about the hot vibration itself. It's a talk about some geometry and algebra topics that come out of it that are uh, some of my favorite things. And here's the brief outline. Let me just get right into it. The hot vibration historically is a map that was invented by Hoff in 1931 as uh, a work in topology, which was then a very young subject. It's a map from the three sphere to the two sphere. The two sphere is the one that you know and love from Calc 3. There are three coordinates here, <coughs> X, Y, and Z. So that's a point on the sphere that's a ball you can hold in your hand. The three sphere is slightly more uh, abstract. We can picture these four dimensions in our head. Some of you maybe can, but I can't. Uh, but it's the same idea. It's a four tuple of real numbers, the squares from which you add up to one. These are the vectors in R4 that are one unit length from the origin. So that's, that's the three spheres. So Hoff invented this map. When you look at this, you'd say, well, who would think of that? Who would think to write it down? It actually has a natural story behind it, and that's part of what I'm going to say about is uh, why, why is this natural and what was he doing? Historically, this was a breakthrough in topology because it was not known at the time much about how spheres map into spheres. And that's one of the simplest kinds of spaces you can ask for if you want to understand the maps from spaces to spaces in topology. And the surprising thing is that the image of that three sphere, think of it as plastered onto the surface of a ball, cannot be shrunk to a point, cannot be deformed. That's very counterintuitive, maybe, unless you have an intuition that's beyond mine. But if you imagine taking a two sphere, plastering it onto a circle, just a one sphere, any way you do that, it's, you can just see it in your mind's eye that you can shrink that down to a point. There's no way you can wrap a two sphere around a one sphere. But you can wrap a three sphere around a two sphere, and that was news. That was news at the time. And in topology, that's the words there are uh, higher homotopy groups. This says that there's a third homotopy group of the two sphere that's not trivial. This map, in fact, is a generator. Uh, at the time, it was known that there were some connections with this to uh, some things in physics, magnetic monopoles, rigid body mechanics of various kinds, and more recently, quantum information theory, uh, which has been around, the, the basics of quantum mechanics have been around for more than 100 years. But as a subject where we're, we're racing to build powerful machines, that's newish, meaning since the 80s and 90s, when people began to really realize that this is something you can do. That's, I mentioned that because I work in quantum information theory, and I was surprised to trip over the hot vibration early on as I was learning this subject myself. And then here's the main thing, is that we have lovely geometry and algebra. So what got me started here was an exercise in a textbook in my first graduate course in Lie theory. So Lie theory is about matrix groups and, and their abstractions and their uh, algebras of tangent planes that go with them. And I'm not going to talk about Lie theory, but early on in the book, there's the description of that Hopf map. And Broker and Tom Deek, the author, say, OK, tanks show the two fibers are linked circles. Now, this, is, this just captured my imagination. And I think it's fair to say this has become an obsession and a theme in my life over the years. So, so let's break down these words. What are these fibers? What's going on? A fiber is just a mapping word for the pre-image of a point. So from the three sphere, we have a mapping to the two sphere. Choose any point on the two sphere and look back at all the points that map to it. Those are points in four space. Now what does it mean to call them? What does it mean to call them a circle? What I mean is they are literally the intersections of two-dimensional planes with the, the four ball, the, the, the ball, the, the the three-dimensional sphere in R4. You actually cut a plane with this four-dimensional sphere. It makes literally a circle like the one you would recognize if you draw it on paper. Uh, and those, those points, those sets of points, are the fibers, the, the 
three images of points to the two spins. Now that in itself isn't obvious, but a little calculation, you can work it out. But the calculation is just horrendous if you don't know anything about what's happening. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of a mess if you start trying to work this out, which is exactly what I did as a young graduate student. I thought, how do you work this out? And I started naively and ran into trouble after seven pages of balled up scratch paper. And I said, how, how do you do this? And, and that got me thinking about it. And I got to thinking about it and realized, not only can you do this, but you can do this, all these calculations for this exercise, in methods that only require second year math major kind of math. I mean, top three. I mean, if you've, if you've done a little bit with vectors and their cross products and their dot products, you've got enough math to do this. And that to me was astonishing. And it led me to continue my obsession. I wrote a paper that was published in Math Magazine back in 2003. And this talk is more or less telling you about this paper, which to me is so, it's still lively. <clears throat> It's still very lively. In fact, it's been on my mind. It was great to get this, this invitation because the citations to this paper have picked up in the last two years. Now, this is one of these weird things where somebody cites your paper when they need to mention the hop vibration, and then somebody else sees that someone else has cited it, so they cite it. And it's, it's not, I, really, I don't claim any fame here. I, there's nothing novel in my paper. It's just exposition. It's telling a story. I like to think that I tell it well. But um, uh, the fact that it is now a highly cited paper in physics and engineering papers is kind of, kind of amusing after 20 years. So here's the schematic. Here's this three sphere that we can't really think seeds, but it has these great circles in it, actual circles. The hot vibration maps those over to the, to the ordinary two sphere. And here's a couple of points, P and Q. Trace them back and find all of the points. There's the pre-image H inverse P all of the points that match to P, all of the points that match to Q, they are in fact linked circles. Okay, now that starts to challenge the visualization uh, abilities of, of me and probably lots of us. So how do we see this? How do you see what's going on in S3? Well, there's this beautiful thing in math that's ancient, 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 and that is the stereographic projection. We're gonna stereographic project these, these points in the three sphere out into three space. Stereographic projection is a beautiful map that takes spheres and maps them to a real, ordinary, real Euclidean space of the same dimension at the price of distortion. You, you, you distort distances, uh, and I'm going to draw a picture of the one dimension down in a minute. But that's how you see it. You can actually calculate everything I've got on this picture in explicit uh, terms, explicit terms, and you can prove that these circles actually lie in different planes and pierce each other with Calc 3 technology. I mean, maybe a little linear algebra, yeah. But not, um, not fancy upper level graduate uh, algebra. Nothing like that is needed. Okay, now here's the fun, another fun part of the story, is how the hot vibration comes up in disguises in various places. So I'll tell you a few of those. But to tell you even anything, we've got to start with the, hot, the uh, uh, stereographic projection. Here's the one that takes two sphere, Oh, I think my red laser has just stopped. The two sphere and maps it out into the plane. I'm going to think of this plane as the complex plane. And how does it work? You take three coordinates ABC up on the sphere, so that's a three space, and I'll form this complex number. So this point, this point will point in the direction of AB, and then uh, one over C scales the thing. So uh, this being a, a standard unit sphere, when C is 1, you're on the North Pole. That's the North Pole. So this is going to go to 0. This fraction blows up to infinity. So we're talking about the, the complex plane with infinity added. That's the map. Uh, and now here is Hopf's map. That one I showed you on that first slide. What is Hopf doing? He's just taking the three sphere. He's mapping it to two-dimensional complex space in this very simple way. Take A and B and make a complex number. Take C and D, remember those are real numbers, and make a complex number. All right, there's a pair of complex numbers. Send those to a fraction. Just make a fraction out of them, stack them up. That fraction now is a complex number. Interpret that complex number as a point on the sphere by running it backwards through the stereographic projection. The stereographic projection is a two-way street. So run it backwards, 
That, I claim, is exactly Pop's map. And I'm not just making this up. It, it's explicit in his paper. Get his 1931 paper. He says, this is how you do it. Because he was already thinking that way. It comes out exactly in coordinates. And the beauty here is you can trace, I'm not going to do it, you can trace all of these things I'm doing with just ordinary algebra. Just quadratic foil rule. Multiply simple things together to do all this stuff. It's, it's really, it's kind of a pleasure to find what's the shortest route, how many fewest number of steps I can do to derive these formulas. So uh, here, is, here is one of my favorites. Actually, it was the one I had to invent for myself to explain the story to myself, which involves quaternions, which is why I'm here today. So the quaternions show up, because if you have a four tuple of real numbers, what else are you going to do with them besides think of them as a quaternion? I mean, come on, real. All you people in this room know that if you have A, B, C, D, you want to think of that as A plus B, I plus C, J plus D, K. And then I'm going to do a little trick to turn those into a pure quaternion. A pure quaternion, you read as a point on the sphere. All right, it goes like this. Here's your quaternion A plus B, I plus C, J plus D, K. And now what you do is you use that as a rotator. It's the same rotation map that Bob and Marshall, Marshall were talking about. It's the same rotation map. You flank a unit, a pure quaternion, K. That K is, is the North Pole. That's 0, 0, 1 as a vector. You flank that thing by R and R conjugate, and um, uh, you get another pure quaternion. Is that length one? Length one, right. So this, this S3 is already normalized. So that's how, you, that's how you get a quaternion to a pure quaternion. You choose the chosen base point, and you rotate it with that first quaternion. It turns into another pure quaternion. Now that's a point on the sphere. Just read it as another x, y, z. and um, there you have it in coordinates. You work all this out. This is what you get. Now, some of you, especially those who are probably real familiar with this, you're saying, wait a minute, you've pulled some monkey business there, and those A's and B's and squares aren't in the same place. And you're right. And the, the punchline to this story is how we're going to reconcile all that. So this is a version of Hopf, which is the same as the first one I showed you. The only difference is there's been some permutation of input and output back. I promise you, it's not really anything different. And now here's another one I love. It comes from geometry that I teach to junior math majors. When you teach Mobius geometry and Kleinian geometry, uh, uh, you teach Mobius transformations. Or maybe you learn it in a complex analysis class. So how would a four tuple of real numbers turn into a Mobius transformation? Well, what else would you do but take A plus B I and A, a minus B I? C plus, you know, this looks a little artificial, right? But if you study Mobius geometry, you might recognize it as a, a very standard form for an elliptic transformation. It's a subgroup of the Mobius group, which you're, if you've done this before, you say, oh, those are the ones that are used for rotations of spheres. So there's no accident that we're going to set it up this way. There's a Mobius transformation made from the four letters A, B, C, D. Now plug in infinity. Just plug in, and when I say plug in, I mean z is a variable. Z is a variable, and it is being mapped to this, this uh, fraction by this function. Plug in infinity, and just like you teach students to do in calculus when you're taking limits to infinity, you just take the fraction of the leading terms, the highest power terms. It really is just a limit. It's a very simple idea. There's no hocus pocus going on. And there's a fraction of complex numbers. Read that complex number as a point on the sphere by inverse stereographic projection. And there you have another hot vibration. Again, yes, there's a difference. There's some minus signs and, and some letters that have been switched around. But otherwise, it is the same map. And uh, I've got one more. Here's the one that's newest to me because I've been only doing quantum information for 20 years. So it's kind of new. But it's still new. And this is a, a coordinate system invented by a physicist named Bloch. So it's called the Bloch coordinate system. But the Bloch coordinate system is itself a hot vibration. And it, it just kind of hit me over the head when I did this. I said, wow, they're doing hot vibrations. Bloch map starts the same thing. We've got four vectors, uh, sorry, four real numbers. Turn them into two complex numbers. That's really what, what, Hoff is, what Bloch is working on, pairs of complex numbers. And now here's something novel. This was new to me to learn this. 
there's a little bit of geometry that any time you have two complex numbers uh, where the everything's normalized, a squared plus b squared plus c squared plus d squared is one, you can extract uh, a real number, cosine and a sine, but now I can't make everything real. Here is a little e to the i theta. There's a rotation of the complex number. And then out here, there's a global phase. E to the physicists say phase for e to the i, real number. So these are all real numbers. The gamma, theta, phi are all real numbers. In physics, you ignore the gamma. Because in quantum mechanics, one of the rules is you can't tell the difference between a state and some phase multiple to that state. There's no experiment you can perform to see the difference. Everything is in a projective world. So I'm saying these things very fast, but that's because I'm not anyway going to explain it. We're working with <laughs> equivalence classes of complex vectors. That's what that's what the quantum state of a single quantum bit. That's what that is. Now in that I'm saying is bury two real numbers, theta and phi, in the standard form for those two complex numbers. Uh, and now read those as the spherical coordinates of a point on the two sphere. What else would you do with theta and phi, right? It's got to be a point on the two sphere. And um, uh, that, I claim, is nothing but the inverse stereographic projection of a plus bi over c plus bi conjugate. Conjugate, because when physicists do math, they inevitably mess something up. I can tell this in this audience. And they reverse the orientation of the conjugation. Now, if only Bloch had known his, his Lee theory, he would not have made that mistake. So he got it backwards, but that's all right. We'll forgive him. And look what it comes out in coordinates. looks like that. There's your Bloch coordinates uh, interpreted as a hot vibration. And there's the picture. This is the, the two complex numbers where I've extracted some stuff and simplified it as much as possible. So there's a real number. There's a complex number, and they just live here on this complex plane with the, with the uh, polar angle theta and the azimuthal angle oh. OK, now, I explain my magic trick. We say, how could all those things be the same? How could all those things be the same? I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you how they could be the same. <laughs> my claim is that they're all the same. Over here on the right is the classic, the standard hop from from the 1931 paper. Here are all the others. All the others are going to fit in over here on this diagram. And the only thing you have to do is some permutations and some signs. T is just going to be a linear map that switches the A's, B's, C's, and D's, and maybe puts some minus signs in funny places. And here's the table. The quaternion map, what's happening across the top is you switch A, B, C, D for A, D, C, B. You just switch the places of two of the input variables. If you do that, the quaternion version and the hot version, you put those two things side by side, they're exactly the same. How about the Mobius one? The Mobius one, you don't do a thing with the order, but you put a minus sign where the C is. That's all it is. It's the only difference with the Mobius one. How about the block one? Uh, well, you need the, everybody in the same place, but two minus signs. And if you trace this through and keep track of orientations, that's the orientation as well. That's, that's, the, that's what physicists are going to do when they grab something perfectly good math thing, to get, a, get their hands on it and switch the direction, make it backwards. All right, I'll stop bashing physicists. Some of you might be physicists, don't you go too far. And let me just say a little bit about um, more algebra geometry. And how am I doing on the time? I feel like I'm racing. You have uh, uh, like nine minutes. You're okay. You're okay. A little bit of more algebra and geometry that, that comes into the story. Um, there's this beautiful story of the rotation groups, like in the last two talks, where it's all about rotations built into this. Um, and they come up in the various stories and various versions. There's the two by two unitaries, there's uniquaternions, you think of those as rotations, the Mobius elliptical group, they seem so different. They come up in different courses in your math curriculums, and they didn't, nobody ever tells you they're the same unless you have enlightened professors. They seem so different, but they're all the same. They're all the same. Also, our stories about projected spaces, this map that takes two complex numbers and maps them to a, a single complex number with, with uh, a phase ambiguity, that's just the mapping from um, two-dimensional complex place to its projectivization, just an equivalence class uh, operation there where you ignore 
Uh, now there is buried in here introdu introductions to Lie groups and homogeneous spaces. I have to bring this up when I teach my students to do summer research with me. I do research in quantum information using undergraduate students as my assistants, uh, and they have to learn a bit. So we do a little bit of background, and they need to learn just a little bit of language of uh, matrix group theory. Uh, but the point is, you don't need a course. There's no prerequisite course in this to start in on quantum mechanics. You just need to know what a matrix is, and that's not a threatening thing. Uh, and here, yeah, this is what I was mentioning. A way to think of the hot vibration is it's just the projective map that takes C2 to its projectivization. Or you can think of it as the, the matrix group, special unitary group, mapped onto what's called its, uh, its flag manifold. But those are all, this is all, these are all just optional words for to describe the same thing that's going on. And the last thing I want to do is reconcile the rotations. Let's get back to rotations because that rotation algebra is just about the most beautiful thing. The way you have the two-fold cover and you can unwind the two spins of the, of the sphere. This, this is so surprising and, and so unintuitive until you thought about it for quite a long time. And these theorems in spherical geometry, they seem so hard. Like, how would you do that? But then you unwind it with some quaternions and it comes out nice and beautiful. So here are the three, the three settings. Here's my unit quaternions, here's my Mobius elliptic transformations, and here's SU2. SU2 is just two by two unitary matrices in a kind of standard form, where you have a number in its conjugate on the main diagonal and a number in its negative conjugate on the off diagonal, and it's normalized. Uh, and now all of these things realize rotations. And uh, I found it interesting, I had to do this out of my obsession. How do you reconcile these different ways? The quaternions, of course, are the most beautiful. Where is the axis in ABCD? It's in BCD. Where else would it be? There's the vector. BCD is the vector that's pointing in the direction about which you are rotating. How much are you rotating, you might ask? You're rotating. All the angle information is in that A, that real part. It's, it's double the inverse cosine of A. There it is. So there's a recipe for a rotation in, in, uh, in quaternions, and it couldn't be nicer. So Mobius transformations, very similar, only the B and the D have to switch, and the C gets a minus sign. All right, but it's the same angle, but there's been kind of a kind of a shuffling and some signs put into the axis. And then what happens in block? Here's the physics version. You have to switch D and B. That's the orientation reversal. You literally can see it here. This is an R3 coordinates. You are switching two of those coordinates. That's an orientation shift. That switches right to left in your universe. And the angle, guess what you pay for that? You have to turn the other way to get the angle right. So that's where the minus sign in front of minus two cosine inverse alpha comes from. And this, this is just what happens to you when you get really get into a problem from your homework. <laughs> and it gets under your skin and you have to do it. But I've done, I've done numerous projects. I've, I've seen this past, but really it's, I've spent so much time with it. And I've had students work on this and uh, we've had a great deal of fun. Uh, so this is just my little blurb. Uh, uh, I, to me, algebra and geometry, either one are great, but when you put them together, they're so much better. They just bring each other to life. Why not put them both together? In fact, I recently overtly designed an introduction to the abstract algebra merged with introduction to modern geometries and put them in the same class. And I've gotten to run it a couple of times. And it is so much fun. And I'm thinking, why not? Why doesn't everybody do this? So I'm happy to talk about this with anybody else who's interested because I've got notes and all kinds of things for this course. If you're thinking about it, you might like to try that too. Um, so what are the topics about topology? It's, you can't really get into topology with just the hot vibration, but you learn a little bit just by contact. Quaternions and rotations, that's the gold mine. That's what just pays back over and over again. Projective geometry, you can't help but, but trip over that when you're thinking about hot vibration. Uh, you can look at it through the Mobius geometry lens. Uh, group actions are hiding in there. In fact, I think that's a great topic everybody needs to learn about group actions. If the only thing you learn from your abstract algebra class is group actions, then it was successful. 
Uh, and then the Lee group introduction to matrix groups, homogeneous spaces, that's in here too. Uh, and then of course, if you're into physics or you get into quantum information, uh, you'll learn block coordinates like on day one. And they're just some saying that's a hot record. Uh, and that is the end. I have a website. If you're interested in this, I've got all kinds of things I've done over the years to students. Uh, contact me, happy to talk to anybody about any of these things I've said. Thank you so much for your attention.